Let's get started. Uh, again, I appreciate everybody showing up, and uh, you're in the room because you either crazy or <laughs> you, uh, you want to become a leader, and uh, and we or your group leader has has signed up on you guys to do that. So again, I want to want to thank everybody for coming out. And, uh, so we're gonna get started. The teaching that we're gonna do first is. It's the character traits of a godly leader, and it was written by Pastor Dale. So, you, some of you may have heard some of this this uh, teaching, but but we're going to start right here. So, what's a leader? Peter Drucker says the only definition of a leader is someone who has followers. Now, we around here we tend to use John Maxwell's version of what a leader is, and if you look, it's a fill in the blank. If you see it, it says leadership is influence. So influence goes in your, your blank there. And that's, that's John Maxwell's version of what a leader is. Okay? Alright? So many people have said if you don't have followers that you're influencing, you're, you're not leading. And there's a Chinese proverb, and, and again, some of this you may have heard, but there's a Chinese proverb that says, he who thinks he is leading but no one is following is just taking a walk. So, <laughs> and if you're walking by yourself, you, know, you need to be think, thinking something's up anyway. So. All right, and then Will Rogers says, if you're riding ahead of the herd, take a look back every now and then to make sure it's still there with you. So if you're leading some, someone, turn around and look and make sure they're, they're still behind you. Make sure they haven't ran off. So, uh, and throughout history, I'm going to go through a little bit of history here, some great historians that have been great leaders. Robert E. Lee, Robert E. Lee, whenever he was in battle, he would go to those campsites. He would go and visit those men and spend time with those men while the other generals, they, they were asleep. But Robert E. Lee, he was there with those guys. He was there supporting those guys, pumping those guys up, you know, telling them they can do it and just giving them that encouragement. Um, General Patton, General Patton, he, he'd get in the tank. And you, there were stories of him, you know, yelling charge. You know, he he was in the front of the line. He was leading those people. And uh, I'm sure it's easy to follow somebody whenever you have that support and that encouragement from 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 these leaders. Um, Napoleon, Napoleon's adversary said once that uh, his presence on the battlefield was worth more than forty thousand soldiers. That's a mouthful right there. I mean that. That right there is is already defeated the enemy. You know, if if you have that kind of support and that kind of uh, influence, uh, you've already, you know, you've already tilled that soul and you, you've got it going on. So, all right. The good thing is leaders have have influence, but the bad thing is leaders have influence. So, with influence comes responsibility, and you've got to be careful. And, and how you lead. and uh, So there's good and bad. And Peter Drucker also says that an effective leader is not someone who is loved or admired. He or she is someone whose followers do the right thing. So leadership is not a popular thing. And, and there, I know there's many of you in this, this room who have led and are leading and you haven't been popular sometimes with, with the uh, area that you lead, whether it be a group leader, whether it be a ministry team leader, there, there's been times you have been popular. And if, if you don't know it, you, you, you will. Somebody will let you know. So, so just keep that in mind. It, it's coming. So, At Sandley Chapel, leadership is important because we're in the business of influencing people to make some, some you know, important, important changes in their lives. We, you know, we're, we're here to help people grow, to help people, um, you know, change for, for the better. So keep that in mind. And remember also that this this change that is happening, that the change that's happening in you, it's a spiritual battle as far as, um, you know, the more you want to do, the more you commit to do, the stronger the battle is going to be the spiritual battle. So keep, keep that in mind. All right. Uh, Failing organizations are usually overmanaged and underled. Uh, again, the leader has the opportunity 
to influence people to change, good or bad. So you, you can either overmanage it or you can lead it. So you can either do the good or the bad. So there's many types, many styles, many personalities of leaders. And in this talk, we're going to, we're going to talk about some different styles, uh, personalities, just you know everything that it's going to take for you as a leader in, in the role that you guys are going to play. The handout is, is an acrostic, and it spells out leader, so... You know Pastor Dale, and he likes to likes to do that, so that's what it is. All right, a godly leader. The L is lives. They live with pure motives. And the principle is integrity. So lives with pure motives, and the principle is integrity. All right. Okay, when Jehoshaphat appointed judges, this is what he instructed them. This is in 2 Chronicles 19.9. It says, These were his instructions to them. You are always to act in the fear of God with honest hearts. What, what does fear of God mean? What, what, what's Respect. your interpretation? Respect. Respect. Reverence. Reverence. Anybody else? Humble. Obedience, humble. So it's basically doing God, doing life God's way. I mean, doing doing it the way God would want you to do. So, so you do it with honest hearts, and that means you don't have hypocrisy. You don't use manipulative motives. Uh, you're honest before God, and uh, you, you do it with integrity. And uh, I like to say that uh, integrity. To me, is not only what you what you do out here in the open where everybody can see it, but it's what you do in the dark, and uh, that, that's that's kind of how I look at it. Whenever you know that pops in my some pops in my head, I'm like, you know, I got to live the same way, or should be living the same way in the dark that I do in the light. So. All right, Proverbs sixteen two says, "All a man's ways seem innocent to him, but motives are weighed by the Lord." That's, that's very important. To, you should always um, be thinking, okay, what's, what's my motive? Why do I want to do something? Or why am I doing this? You need to check your motive. You, 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 know, you always got to do that. Now, I know that sounds simple, and that sounds like that's a no-brainer, but that's one of the things that when Pastor Dale came, it was one of the, the first things that, that I called on that he, he had shared with us as, as leaders. You know, what is your motive? Why do you want to lead? Why do you want to do this? Or why are you saying this? And uh, that's always stuck out in my head. So, you know, same thing. Why do you want to lead a group? Why do you want to lead a ministry team? You know, why do you want to do this? Is, is it for the glory? Or is it because you don't, you know, want to win a popular contest? <laughs> so, so, in the book, Becoming a Contagious Christian... It was written by Bill Hobbles and, and Mark Middleberg. It tells the story of a newly promoted colonel who had moved into a makeshift office during the Gulf War. He was getting unpacked when out of the corner of his eye he noticed a private with a toolbox coming his way. Wanting to seem important, he grabbed the phone and he said, Yes, General Schwarzkopf, of course, I think that's an excellent plan, he continued. You've got my support. Thanks for checking with me. Let's touch base again. Goodbye, Norm. And what can I do for you? He asked the private, and the private said, I'm, I'm here to hook your phone up. So, you know, what is your motive? You, you know, what, you're trying to look good in, you know, in front of someone? So, always check your motives. All right, Proverbs 20, verse 5. The purposes of a man's heart are deep waters. But a man of understanding draws them out. I thought, man, I was, when I was doing studying this, I'm like, I've never, never read that verse, but that's, that's good stuff. How do you draw that understanding out? And King David tells how to do that. First Chronicles 12, 16, and 17 says, Other Benjamites and some men from Judah also came to David in his stronghold. 
David went out to meet them and said to them, If you have come to me in peace, help me. I'm ready to have you unite with me. But if you have come to betray me to my enemies when my hands are free from violence, may the God of our fathers see it and judge you. Which again, I mean, that's pretty strong words that, uh, that David spoke there. You know, God's going to God's going to judge us. He's going to judge us. Those motives that we have, the integrity that we don't have, you know, according to the Word, and we all believe the Word, you know, he's, he's going to judge us. So you need to ask yourself three questions. And in these three questions, have you come in peace? That's the first question. Have you come to help? I mean, are you coming to, to lead a group of, of people that you want to shepherd towards the vision that Sandley Chapel uh, has that, that God has given us? Um, will you be concerned about not getting out of step? Are you a lone ranger? You want to do it your way? You want to go about and, and do your agenda? Or will you constantly look for ways to, to stay in step with the vision that, that Sandley Chapel's got going on, that God's, God's doing here? And third, will you betray us? Or will you betray me? Will you betray your leader? Will you, be, you know, will you betray someone? Again, is that do you have a hidden agenda? You know, is, is there a dagger hidden in your cloak? What you know, what is your agenda um, for for becoming a leader? All right. So again, you can jump back up to uh, First Chronicles there with David when he said. Uh, may the God our Father see it and, and judge you. So whatever it is, whatever your agenda, you know, God, God is going to judge us. He is the judge. Okay, E. Establishes healthy relationships. Establishes healthy relationships. Alright, to be able to do this, it's got to be more than, than a gifting. Um, you know, do you have a problem getting along with people, or do you know people that has a problem getting along with people? And you know that that that's not. I mean, it's not an intelligence problem. <laughs> it's a people skill, social skill problem. So if you find you you know you you, you have a, you have problem getting along with people, or uh, you look behind you and there's nobody behind you. <laughs> <laughs> it could be you have a problem establishing healthy relationships. Yeah, there's nobody sitting beside Pastor Linda. You know. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that was my choice. <laughs> Rachel. That's all right. That's all right. All right, so the principle is unity. 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 U N I T Y. Oh, no. We're going to have this translated into Spanish. That's great. Don't okay. Don't All right, so the principle is unity. All right, that's the goal. I mean, we all want unity. Everybody wants to see unity. I want to be a part of it. I mean, that is the goal, is to have unity. And, and we try to, to get unity. Uh, on the vision and move ahead by consensus. Not everybody's going to have unity. Not everybody's going to want to be a part of the consensus. But, but that's our goal as far as this vision of what we're doing at Sandley Chapel. Alright? But again, unity is not absent of conflict. Can anybody? Amen. There, there's my amen. Okay. So, so there, there could be conflict. I mean, that, that's just normal. But... Uh, but the presence of we want the presence of agreement is what is what we're after here, you know, and that's that's what unity is. And agreement produces unity, and unity produces community, and that's where you have authentic relationships is whenever that takes place. And there's no place uh, for egos like I'm the leader. You're gonna do what I tell you to do. I mean, I'm the one. I mean, we. That's just that's that's not godly. That's not of God, and I mean that's that's not what we're about. So we're we're all working for the same goal. So 
Keep that in mind. So John 17, 21 says, My prayer for all of them is that they will be of one heart and one mind, just as you and I are. Father, that just as you are in me and I am in you, so they will be in us. And the world will believe you sent me. So a godly leader works in unity within the body. And, and we're going to tell a little story here. And, and again, may, you may have heard the story. Pastor Dale tells the story. He's told it from the, the pulpit. But it's the story of Herman Ostry. And uh, Herman Ostry's barn was under 29 inches of water because of a rising creek in Bruna, Nebraska. And this farmer invited a few friends to a barn raisin. Anybody know what a barn raisin is? Raise that's barn. all I do. <laughs> that's like raising the roof. But, no, okay. <laughs> but, together. but this was a different type of barn raisin. He needed to move his entire 17,000 pound barn to a new foundation more than 143 feet away. His son might devise the lattice working of, of steel tubing and he nailed it, bolted it, and welded it on the inside and outside of the barn to where there were hundreds of handles sticking out of this, this barn. After one practice lift, 344 volunteers slowly walked the barn up a slight incline, each supporting less than 50 pounds in just three minutes. The barn was on its new foundation. The body of Christ can accomplish great things when we work together. Could you imagine moving a 17,000 pound barn and, and not more than one person had 50 pounds to carry? <laughs> they, I mean, that's what happens, you know, just like Joan said, you know, you do, do you know 300 or something? But, uh, but the thing is, we know each other here in what we're doing in this vision and you know, everybody gets to hold the handle in, on the vision that's at Sandley Chapel. So that's the great news. Okay, the A accepts leadership. Accepts leadership. So at Sandley Chapel, every godly leader has a leader. Every leader has a leader here at Sandley Chapel, someone over them. Someone reports and answers to, you know, somebody. So keep, keep that in mind. And the principle is submission. So the principle is submission. Okay? Alright, there's what we call the submission principle. You can't have authority unless you can submit to authority. So that's the what, what we call the submission principle. You can't have authority unless you can submit to authority. Alright. So God's Word is, is clear about this characteristic trait also. And uh, I don't know if you noticed, but God is a God of order. I mean, you can look from the beginning of time in Genesis whenever He started everything to, I mean, you could just look all throughout the Bible and see, see if there's order in, in, in what God does. So, everything has order. Ephesians 4, 11, 12 says, It was He who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up. In Ephesians 5.21 says, Honor Christ by submitting to each other. So God not only expects us, but He instructs us to submit to authority. Um, and you know, I've heard many people say, Well, I'm not going to do that. But, you know, talking about, I mean, even it talks about the government in, in the Bible. You know, people say, well, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that. I'm, you know, I mean, according to the Bible, I mean, it's not submitting to, to authority. So, um, so, you know, you got to, whether it be the government or your leader, um, you, 
you need to, to submit according to the Word. Alright, Numbers 11, 16, and 17. The Lord said to Moses, Bring me seventy of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Have them come to the tent of meeting, that they may stand there with you. I will come down and speak with you there. And I will take you, or I will take of the spirit that is on you and put the spirit on them. They will help you carry the burden of the people so that you will not have to carry it alone. So we believe at San Lee Chapel that God has sovereignly, you know, blessed this vision of what's going on here and, and, and the vision that He's given us. We believe that it's only God that, that things are happening here and that, that the vision is moving forward. So we know it's not us and we, we, we know that, uh, that it's God. So whenever uh, we come in agreement with, with God, you know, God does things. God blesses things. And God anoints things when we come in agreement with Him. So, so this church is not not any result of, of necessarily one person or you know what one person's doing. I mean, it's it's the the handles that everybody's taking place of. It's the handles that that you guys have taken and are helping move this vision forward. All right. So. Again, as, as we were talking about submission, as we submit to God's authority, we submit to those leaders above us. Um, you know, you're going to do just like the last scripture said in, in, in Numbers there, where he said, your anointing will be passed on to them. And that's what, that's what God does. He'll pass that on. But the moment you step out of that anointing, you've, you've heard Pastor Dale say many times that once you step out of that umbrella, you know, you're, you're on your own. So keep that in mind as far as the submission goes and, and keep that trait as far as the, the submission. You know, keep that in your mind, keep it in your heart, and keep it, keep it, you know, keep that fresh to, you know, to your spirit there. Okay, so you might be thinking, well, I'm, I'm submitted. You know, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm submitted. I'm ready to do this thing. Um, but, you know, a lot of times you don't really know how submitted or how committed you are until the fire comes. And uh, you can just think about Paul whenever he got off of that boat. And uh, on the, when he was shipwrecked, he got off the boat and they were gathering the sticks and gathering the wood to, to start fire, and he reached in there, and when the fire, you know, he didn't get off that boat. <laughs> <laughs> he had to swim. Well, he made it too short. <laughs> so he survived. So whenever he got off the boat, and they had the, they were gathering the wood. He stuck his hand in there to grab the stick. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't that easy and it's not going to be easy for us <laughs> so, so anyway he reached in there and when he did the snake he pulled his hand out and the snake was attached to his hand and, uh, and you know what really drew that out was the fire and so what you're going to find out is you, you say you're committed now but when the fire comes how submitted you know, are you going to be or how committed are you going to be when that comes Thanks, Brenda. <laughs> All right, D. I was just testing you. I wanted to see how committed you were. <laughs> yeah. I was submitted. I just saw how committed. All right, D demonstrates personal growth. Demonstrates personal growth. Maybe I just showed you how I'm I just read that story, so that's how I knew yeah. it. I, I did too. It's been a while. Sean can tell you when it was. Okay. All right. The principle is maturity. So it demonstrates personal growth, and the principle is maturity. Okay, so in 1 Timothy 3 6, it says, The pastor must not be a new Christian because he might be proud of being chosen too soon, and pride comes before a fall. 
I am going to read, read you another story here. Any, anybody ever heard of Corey Ten Boom? Yes. Okay. Corey Ten Boom, she was a Holocaust victim and she lived in the Netherlands. And her dad was a, a watchmaker. And she would, she would go with him on trips. And one day she headed out on the train with them to uh, Amsterdam for the day. And when she had learned, she had told him of a poem that she had learned at school. And, and in the poem, there was a line in there about sex. And she asked her dad, you know, what was, what was sex? And he, you know, he was quiet. He didn't say anything for, for a long time. And then when they were getting off the train, he asked her to, to pick up his toolbox. And she said she couldn't. She said it was too heavy. And, and he explained to her that, you know, that you're young and that there's some things that are just too heavy for you right now. Later on, you know, you know, we can talk about it, but right now it's too heavy for you. And that's how it is, you know, with, with Christians, you know, with young Christians. Some things are, are just too heavy right now. And it might be best to not jump into the middle of something or leading, leading something. Um, so we want to make sure that when you commit to this, that this is what you want to do and, you know, to pray about it because, again, some things are just, you know, too heavy for a new Christian. All right. Exodus 18.21 says, But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men, who hate honest, men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Okay, what, what are some of the things you see there as far as um, some, some uh, characteristics that, that he was looking for there? What are some of the characteristics that you see? Capable. Capable. What else? Trustworthy. What's that? Trustworthy. Trustworthy. Fear God. Fear God. Integrity. Integrity. Standing for what's right. Standing for what's right. That's right. They select them. Yeah, and they select them. They select them. That's right. So capable, those who fear God, trustworthy, and hate honesty, hate dishonesty. All right. E. Effectively serves. Effectively serves. The principle here is servanthood. Servanthood. First Peter 4.10 says, Each of you received a spiritual gift. God has shown you His grace and given you different gifts. And you are like servants who are responsible for using God's gifts. So be good servants and use your gifts to serve each other. All right. All right, God's always done things in, in a way that seems to, to baffle uh, just the average man, the, the world. I mean, he, he's done things like the first, you know, if you want to be first, you should be last. Uh, he, he's, instead of earning your way to God, you know, you come as a child. Uh, you've got to release the power, or let me back up, you've got to have, release the control to have power. Um, but the one that really gets us most is in Luke when he talks about, he says, who is the least among you? He is the greatest. And, you know, that just goes against anything and everything that this world says. You know, this world says you, you should be the top dog. You should be, you know, it should be a dog-eat-dog -dog world. You should be number one. You should get, it's yours. You should, you, you have a, have the right to, to get it. And uh, it just, that just goes totally against what God's Word says there. Um, but, you know, and he also said, he told David, he said, he said, go tend the sheep. And he told the disciples to, to go feed the, feed the 5,000. And, you know, those were the disciples. Those were the, the, the right-hand men of God. And he was telling them to, to serve, to go, you know, to go do these things. Um, all right, 2 Kings 3, 11 through 12. But Jehoshaphat asked, is there no prophet of the Lord here? 
that we may inquire of the Lord through him? An officer of the king of Israel answered, Elisha, son of Shaphat, is here. He used, to, he used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. Jehoshaphat said, <laughs> Rachel, you're going to get kicked out. Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is on him. So basically what he said, he took, they took the guy that poured the water on the hands of Elijah, you know, the servant. They took the servant and said, okay, let's take him. And you know, the word of the Lord is on him. Which doesn't make sense to the, you know, our human, the human side of us. It shouldn't should be like that, but that's how, how God does. You know, those who serve, you know, that's who he's looking for, is leaders. Alright, some quotes. Martin Luther King said, Everyone or everybody can be great because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and your verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love. George Bush said, Use power to help people, for we are given power not to advance our own purposes, nor to make a great show in the world, nor a name. There is but one just use of power, and it's to serve people. So you can compare that to the little girl who came home from church and said, I want to be like the man who stood up front. And the mom said, you want to be a, a pastor? She said, no, I just want to tell everybody what to do. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's what we, you know, our human nature is we want to just tell everybody what to do. But that's not what God says. All right, R, respond to God's call. Respond to God's call. Right. You ever notice that uh, most of you, maybe all of you, whenever someone asks you to, to lead or to be a leader or to think about it, most of you, and I, I know I did, were like, oh. I don't know about all that. And I'm still like, I, I don't know about all that. Um, but uh, you know that's that's who God's after. He, he's you know he's after that that person that's uh, you know not too too sure because I mean you can look throughout throughout the Bible. I mean you think of Moses who was like I, I, stu I stutter. I mean I I'm not one to you know to share your word. You think about Jonah. I mean he. I mean, he took off. There, there's a lot of people throughout the Bible that has resisted the calling on them. Um, and I, I probably can imagine that y'all feel the same feel the same way in your own life. So, and to be honest with you, we're, we're kind of nervous about the one that says, let's do it. Because those usually don't, don't pan out. The ones that want to just change the world. I know Pastor Dale and I joke sometimes whenever somebody comes like the first the first day and they want to they want to you know do it all they want to change the world they want to you know just start this do this do that and blah 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 and you know our little thing is man we sure are going to miss them we like them <laughs> <laughs> so anyway <laughs> yeah all right Jeremiah twenty nine says and I can't quit. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't tell you the principle. Obedience. Obedience. And obedience is stronger than submission. Okay. Obedience. Jeremiah 29. And I can't quit. For if I say I'll never again mention the Lord, never more speak His name, then his word in my heart is like fire that burns in my bones. And I can't hold it any longer. Amen. Every time I read that, it just, I mean, it just, man, it just, it's, it's in my bones. And I was talking to a, to a man yesterday, and we, we were talking about that. And as soon as we, we quoted that scripture, I, I wish you could have seen his eyes. I mean, he just 
big old alligator tears just welled up. And he had he just had this passion about serving and, and doing something for great for God. And that's the thing about it is, you know, once that's that's in you, that calling's in you, that passion's in you. I mean, you just you can't get it out. It, it it doesn't it doesn't matter. And I mean, I can look at look at you guys and see. I mean, even now, just hearing that scripture, a lot of you, you know, those tears are coming up in your eyes. Is something you you just can't get out. But uh, it's not saying you you don't have a choice. I mean, we all have a, have a choice. And uh, but when it's it, when it's in the bone, when it's it's down there like like the fire. I mean, it's just something you you can't you can't get rid of. And uh, but you know uh, you probably heard this too that a, a volunteer can quit, but if you're called, you, you can't because it's in your bones. You can't get it out. So, all right. And, and again, we don't want to talk nobody into anything. We want we want all of you guys to to be praying. We want you know we don't want you to do something that you're going to regret. We don't want you to do something that that turns you from from growing in the Lord, we, we want this, we want you in the position that uh, that you're called to be in. And we want that passion. We want you to have that passion as well. So, I'm going to finish up there at the bottom. It's a, a poem here. It says, A Godly Leader. A Godly Leader finds strength by realizing his weakness. A godly leader finds authority by being under authority. A godly leader finds direction by laying down his own plans. A godly leader finds vision by seeing the needs of others. A godly leader finds, did I just say that, vision by seeing the needs of others. A godly leader finds credibility by being an example. A godly leader finds loyalty by expressing compassion. A godly leader finds honor by being faithful and a godly leader finds greatness by being a servant. That's by Roy Lesson. So that's it for this session. We're going to take about five minutes and then Pastor Linda's going to come up and uh, do the next section. Thank you. Um, what I'm going to talk to you tonight about is growing spiritually and I want to tell you right up front what I'm talking to you about is a topic that I love. So what I'm going to try to do is just bless you. Bless you. Uh, I'm going to try to just um, talk to you about what I love talking about. So I'm going to try to just relax and uh, and get through the material. The main goal of what I want you to get tonight is not so much me or how I present it to you. What I want you to get is what I'm actually talking about. Okay? I want you to learn something. Um, when you leave tonight, I want you to not remember anything about me, but I want you to go home tonight inspired that, hey, I've either been doing this, Linda says I'm on the right track, and I'm excited, or I want you to go home and say, hey, I'm, I've got to rely on my priorities. And that's, that's where I'm at. That's the heart I'm going to give you tonight. Are y'all good with that? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, and, I, and I like feedback. So y'all, um, I say I like feedback. I don't know. i never done this. I think I might like feedback. I like feeding. So maybe I like feedback too. Um, Philip Yancey said the giants all had one thing in common. It was neither victory nor success. Did you know what they had? Passion. Passion. They had passion. Uh, absolute identity with one's cause is the first and great, greatest condition of a successful leadership. And I noticed when Pastor Shane started his teaching, he was telling you about different leaders and the way, I guess, they got their people involved and got their, really their passion level going. And so I just wanted to share just a little bit about my life and I guess what has inspired me to even do what I enjoy doing. Uh, growing up, I was raised in alcohol, and my friends could never come to my house because my parents, it was not a place that my friends were safe to spend the night. Um, finally, my, I had a girlfriend who was honest with me, and she finally said, Linda, you're always welcome at my house. She had a good home. She said, my parents love you, and, and we love you. 
She said, but I'll never be able to go spend the night at your house. She said, I hate to tell you that. And she said, I don't think they'll ever love you. But she said, your parents drink, and I'll never be able to go up there and stay. So she finally just told me, so I quit asking. Um, and, and I was fine with that. Then I had other girlfriends that they could come to my house and stay because their parents drank too, and the party was on at both houses, and it didn't really matter. But I found out later as I grew up that, you know, you, you have different things in your life that mold you. And I guess it's like a spirit of rejection of always really wanting that home, that secure home that my friends could be welcome at, and not really having that um, growing up. You know, I found seeking God and and drawing close to people in the church that had that kind of a home. And and those people began pointing me to God and, and pointing me to His Word, feeling that kind of love and security, which is what I didn't have. Now, I had love. I was never abused at home. I never had to worry about anything like that. Um, so I, I never had that, which some people have to face. Um, and so through that process, um, I, I, I think that's where I'm at now, is wanting people to feel at home. And I, I sort of, I didn't realize it, to be honest with you, until several months ago. It's like what Satan meant for bad, God meant for good. And so what do I do now? I, I'm a connections pastor. I want to make sure when people come through the door, they feel at home at Stanley Chapel. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, how cool is that, that, that God took really what was my greatest heart as a child and is allowing me to use that in ministry. So as a leader, that's what I'd like to inspire with you. Uh, maybe that's not your story, but what's your passion level? You know, what is it that causes you to want to work with kids? You know, what is it that causes you to, uh, to want to work with music? That, you know, just burns inside of you uh, when you're on the drums. You know you're taking people, you know that you're touching them in their heart or they're laying down their addictions. You know, or uh, in the office with administration, whatever it is, you know that God, through your childhood, through your raising, through your quiet times with your Bible, those those are your passions that drive you to, to leadership. Because it's like Pastor Shane said to begin with, we're here tonight because there's something burning in us that we want to do more than just sit on a pew. God has called us not only to sorrow, but we want to do more than sorrow. We want to lead, and we want to lead with excellence, and we want to lead with passion. And I know Melissa and I have talked about it many times. You know, we want that passion to burn to where we just don't want the humdrum of checking the box. We got to do this. We got. We want that passion. And and uh, and for me, that's where my passion came from. I don't have to try to make people feel at home. It's a natural gift, and I think it came. From that, so you know, some of you may be here tonight, and you're not exactly sure what area you want to go into. Uh, search your hearts and see what your natural giftings are. And I just want to encourage you. That I don't know if it'll help you, you know, you're not. And I don't even know if it really has anything to do with what I'm going to talk to you about. But I just want you to know a little bit about me and and some of my background before I get started. Um, there's three. Disciplines for spiritual growth, and I feel like probably a lot of you already know some of the material we're going, we're going to go over tonight. But like I say, we go through areas in our life to where you can you can get away from this, you can become dry, desert areas, and um, we've just done intimacy with God here at the church, and the ladies here, we found out that you do go through cold spots to where you, you don't read your Bible, you don't pray, you don't have that fellowship with God like you should, so I don't think this will hurt any of us to go over this material. Um, but the three disciplines for spiritual growth, number one, it goes in your blank, is Bible reading. Um, and we're going to come back and talk about these. Number two is prayer. And number three is a lifestyle of worship. The first one is talking about Bible reading. Psalms 119.11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. That was the very first Bible verse we had here at Sandlin Chapel that we memorized with the very first group we ever had here. That was our first Bible verse that we memorized. And the reason we want to do that is, you know, if, if we don't have that in our heart, we're going to have something in our heart. It's either going to be 
your soap operas, it's going to be your golf game, it's going to be your job, it's going to be your worries, your problems, it's going to be whatever it is, your dirty jokes, it's going to be your gossip at work, it's going to be something in your heart. You're going to have something in there that's going to take up that space. And I have found if you take time to memorize the scriptures, that takes time. And if you take the time to do that, you're not going to have a whole lot of time for a bunch of that other stuff. And the Word tells us to hide His Word in our heart. I mean, and He knows that that's helpful for us. That's a good exercise. And I tell my small group all the time, memorize your Bible verses. They don't put that in our cell lessons just to take up space. That's a healthy exercise for us to do. Uh, Psalms 119.16 says, I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. We have, to, we have to keep God's word always, every day. We have to feed on it. You can't neglect the word of God. Do you all agree with that? Amen. It takes daily intake, right? We, yes. we got to be in the word. You've got to be in the word every day. Um, just like we have to eat every day unless you're fasting or whatever. you got to have the Word every day. Uh, Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what is good, pleasing, and perfect will. So y'all all agree we need to be in God's Word, right? Yes. Most of you in here, you love the Bible, you love to read the Bible, and you pretty much agree what's in the Bible. Most of you. Alright, I want y'all to do something. We're going to have a little bit of fun tonight. I gave all of you a little packet there to the corner of your thing. You see the little index cards there? Mm -hmm. There's just some little tools to use with your Bible. Pastor Shane, you need to get you one. I'm good. Oh, you don't want one? Okay. Alright, everybody get your little index card out. Because <coughs> this, right, this right here, this is the only thing that's going to get us through the life right here. The written word of God. Okay, everybody ready? You got your pen? My group knows what I'm fixing to do. Yeah. Some of you may not know this and don't be ashamed because I didn't know this until about two months ago. Okay, so I'm standing before you and I couldn't have done this two months ago. On the count of three, write down your Ten Commandments. You <coughs> love the Word of God, it's in the Ten Commandments. Go. One, two, three, write them down. Two months ago, I couldn't have done it, Pastor Dale had asked me to. Neither could Pastor Shane. I had to say, Carol was the only one in our group that could do it. What? Carol was the only one in our group that could do all the Ten Commandments. Oh, at the first time. At the first time. <laughs> Damn girl. Sorry. Carol I did learn it. I did learn it. All right, we got to concentrate. Yeah. So, so sorry. <laughs> do we have to be in the Yes. Okay. Okay. Go on, let's start. Somebody give me one. Come here, Nana. What'd you say? I shut my coat All right, somebody give me another one. No, 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 love your God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Okay. All right. Kill, there's three. Murder, don't murder, don't steal. Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath. Give me another one. Don't commit adultery. Yeah. Honor mother and father. Honor your mother and father. They're saying that. Huh? Do not take the Lord's name in vain. Take the Lord's name in vain. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. That's not eight. No other gods before you. Nine. One more. Don't bear false witness. Don't fair false witness. Fair false witness. Very good. That's good. Y'all did good. But I'm going to tell you one thing. Like I say, two months ago, I couldn't have wrote down all the Ten Commandments. But yet I go around saying we need to read our Bibles. 
We need to be familiar with our Bibles, you know? Um, we change the way we think by studying and reading the Word. For an example, when we're little and we grow up, we, you know, we automatically, we don't share. We learn from our parents and our cousins and everybody else. When somebody does you wrong, you learn not to forgive. From the time you're little and on up, you learn when somebody does you wrong. You, you hear mom and dad talking about it and how they going to get back with you and stuff and all. So when you become an adult, it's hard when you read the Word and God's Word says we have to forgive. And God's Word says we don't hold grudges. And God's Word says, you know, give and don't ask for nothing in return. But the way that you overcome that is you keep reading God's Word. And God's Word melts and it, it breaks up that hard ground. And there's nothing else that can do that other than the Holy Spirit and reading God's Word. In any of these areas that you have trouble in, you just have to keep reading the Word and praying and asking God to reveal that to you. Um, Proverbs 23, 7, I love this verse, says, For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Your actions are a direct result of your thoughts. So, whatever you think on, that's what you want to act on. So if you've got areas in your life that need changing, then you're going to have to find you some scriptures, and you're going to have to change the way you think about it. Um, I don't know how many of you listen to Joyce Myers, but she can teach you something about your thinking. So if you need some changing on thinking, get you some Joyce Myers books. Because you got to change the way you think. If you've got um, areas that have got to be worked on, you've got to work on your thinking first, and then your actions will follow. Um, whatever that area is, look at those scriptures on it. If you have trouble with anger, and look up your scriptures on anger and study them. If you have trouble with forgiveness, then look up your scriptures on love. Look up on the opposite. Um, if you have trouble with worry, um, you know, look in Psalms. It talks a lot about trusting God. You can trust God. You don't have to worry. And the more you read these, your thinking's going to change to where you know you can trust God. You're going to gain more confidence in Him. But it's not going to come through talking to your friends or through watching TV or through sleeping. It's going to come through studying the world. It's going to take time and diligence. Y'all believe it? Yes. 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 You got it? Yes, boss. The weekend's coming. Y'all going to have some time this weekend to study your word. All right. John 8, 31 and 32 says, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Okay? So we're going to talk about having a Bible study and going deeper. But before we do that, I, I just I want to tell you that there's a difference in having a quiet time and having a Bible study. Um, when I read this, it really set me free because when I first got saved, I thought every morning I was supposed to be having a Bible study. And so I was like, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Because I, I, I envision myself like when I hear Pastor Dale preach or anybody else preach, I see them with the desk with a bunch of books and they're just dove into it and they're getting all this knowledge. And I thought, I just can't do that every morning. I can't get up early enough and I can't get it done before I go to work. So I just felt defeated and I didn't do anything. But God wants to have quiet time with you every morning. He doesn't expect you to have Bible study every morning. He wants you to have Bible study. But, and that's when you dive in and you, you study a topic or, like I say, if you're struggling with anger, if you need to stru uh, study about money or forgiveness or whatever. But he wants quiet time with you every day. Now, if you're a morning person, do your mornings. If you're a night person, do nights. Don't get hung up on that. And I used to... You know, I used to feel like, well, it has to be in the mornings. And, and from the scriptures, Jesus did do the mornings. And me personally, I'm a morning person. You know, ask Melissa Siles. I bump her a lot, and I love to jump on her bed wide open real early in the morning. She hates that. I'm like, hey, hey, it's morning time. And she pulls covers over her head. So I'm a morning person. So that mornings work good for me. But the thing about it to remember is, Jesus wants that fellowship with you before you go to work. 
And, and for you know, those of you that's, that's married or ever been married, you know, you think about your, your relationship with your spouse. Like when I get up in the morning, I'll, I'll have my quiet time and I'll take the dogs out and make the coffee. And with Lou, then I'll get him up, make his coffee, and I'll give him a hug when I get him up, give him a kiss, fix his coffee. All right, Rachel. <laughs> I'll fix his That's coffee. <laughs> Ask him if he's, you know, if he's slept good and give him a good little hug and all. And then before I leave, I'll hug him, tell him to have a good day and all that. That's how we start off our day. That's our quiet time. That's not maybe our Saturday night time. That's not our Bible study. The reason I'm telling you this, the reason I'm telling you this is because I want to be bold enough that I don't want you to just stay sitting on the pew and you never go no deeper with God than you still get offended in church. And that you still carry your feelings on your shoulders. And you still never grow up. You follow me? I want to give you an example bold enough that it's going to shake you up and you're going to, in the morning, you're going to say, or maybe tomorrow night, you're going to say, I need to have some Bible study time with God. And when you start doing that, your offenses maybe that you have, you're going to learn to forgive. You're going to become more of a team player. Some of that stuff Pastor Shane talked about, you're going to be able to do some of that stuff. But if you don't ever mature, that comes with maturity. That stuff comes after marriage. You follow me? That comes with maturity. Just like with the toolbox. You don't pick it up when you're little. That's what we're heading toward. We're talking about growing spiritually. Grow, becoming mature leaders. You can't lead people till you mature. And so I want you to think about that. And I want you to grow spiritually and be healthy so you can lead other people. Is that making sense? Yep. Yeah. So that's why I give you that example. I won't tell Blue. That's why he wouldn't come tonight. He's saying to tell him what you say. Um, all right, so now let's talk about, we got all that behind us. When you have your quiet time, you can use any kind of devotional, or you can just use your Bible. I, I have a lot of devotionals. I love this one. You can read something in the morning, or like I say, you can read your Bible. You can just worship with music. You can just pray. You can just talk to God. You know, whatever you want to do. Uh, if you want to do something very creative, you can talk to Sean afterwards. I know he's doing some stuff in the mornings with some of the guys. I think it's great. That's a quiet time in the morning where he's challenging them with their quiet time. Do not copy and paste. He will get you. Um, <laughs> it's just holding each other accountable and growing in that area. So, um, do y'all understand the difference though? And can you see how it would relieve you so that you don't feel like you got to be real spiritual? God wants that fellowship every morning, every night, or at lunchtime. Some of our ladies were talking about they had it at lunchtime. And uh, it's very important. So when you have your Bible study time, what I want to help you with with that, uh, for me, I didn't know how to study my Bible. And uh, Pastor Dale told me, he said, go to the carpenter shop, and get you, he said, Rick Warren's got a good book that'll help you learn how to study your Bible. Now, Pastor Dale, he, he does a lot of his stuff on computer, because he's good with the computer. But y'all that know me, I have to have a book and a notepad and a pen. <coughs> so if you're computer savvy, you may do better with a computer. You can pull up a lot of that. Or, you know, if you're more hands-on, you can use this material that I'm talking about. But this has helped me a lot. Um, even with leading group, I've been able to to go more in depth with some of my topics. So I'm hoping maybe this will help some of you if you're starting out or if you're leading a group or even your ministry teams. Um, the first thing you need to do is you gotta schedule that Bible study time. You gotta make that commitment. That's the first thing you have to do. That goes in your blank. You have to schedule your Bible study time. Reason being, if you don't say, hey, every Friday night or uh, if you're off, a day of the week, say every Monday morning first thing, I'm going to do that, we won't do it. We won't make it. you got to make it priority. If we don't make it priority, we'll never do it. I found that to be true in my life, and I'm sure y'all do too. The second thing that is good to do is to keep a notebook. That goes in your blank. 
you know, I've given y'all some of these little tools that you can use this weekend. I hope you will. Uh, you haven't really thought through a biblical text until you put the thoughts gained from it into writing. You can't study the Bible without writing something down. And that's the difference between reading the Bible and studying the Bible. When you study it, you write it down, you're figuring out your thoughts. You're doing more than just reading it. Your thoughts disentangle themselves when they go past your lips or through your fingertips. I always encourage people that I talk to to read your Bible out loud to yourself, especially if they're down and out. I tell them, I say, read your Bible out loud to yourself. Go to Psalms and read out loud. It will really encourage you. If you've never done that, I encourage you. Open up your Bible when you're by yourself and just read out loud to yourself. There's power in hearing God's Word, even if you're the one reading it. Anybody ever done that before? Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's my power app read it to me. Yeah. Nice. I mean, it really is. Yeah. Um, so one of the most profitable things you can do in your spiritual life is to start some kind of a spiritual notebook in which you write down thoughts and insights that God's given you. Keep up with that. Number three, get the right tools. It goes in your blank. You may be able to invest in only one every so often, but just start as you can. Now there again, some of you may not be hands-on like books. I personally like books, so that's whatever your preference is. Um, and I brought mine with me tonight if y'all want to look at them, but I'm going to just give you a list of if you want to invest at home. I had never really thought about it, but you know, as women, we invest in all different color of high heels and pocketbooks to go with our outfits. And men, they like the different kinds of bows and guns for all the different seasons or the different kinds of fishing poles for the fly pole and the cane pole. And I mean, we invest in that kind of stuff, don't we? But I had never thought about investing in a library to help me learn more about God's Word, to, to help me be smarter in knowing about God and studying His Word. So when I got this list, I started working on my library, and it's really helped me a lot, and I've enjoyed having it. Um, so here's um, some of the tools. The first one is a study Bible, first and most important, because uh, it has wide margin for making notes and a good cross-reference, and you can get a large print if you need that at my age. <laughs> um, you can get several translations like the uh, New American or the Amplified, the uh, New Living. These are just some examples. Um, and I found whenever I started looking at home, I had quite a bit of these things already. I just didn't have them all together in one place like a library. When I started looking, I had stuff all over the house and I pulled it together. I had a, a lot of these tools already. Um, an exhausted concordance, which I don't know why I didn't put the, uh, what that is, it's a Bible index of the words uh, contained in that version. Uh, a number of Bibles have a limited concordance at the back, but the exhausted has listed every usage of the word. So in, in the Bible, whatever that language is, it will have those words. But the exhaustive concordance, it has a list of all the words for all of the languages. And like I say, if you want to look at these when we take or when we get through tonight, I've got them up here. Uh, a Bible dictionary. A Bible dictionary explains many of the words, topics, customs, and traditions in the Bible as well as giving historical, geographical, and cultural information. And a topical Bible is similar to a concordance, except it categorizes the verses of the Bible by topics instead of by words. I thought this was really cool. Uh, for example, if you was to look up the word Trinity, you can't find the word Trinity in the Bible. But if you go to the topical Bible, there's 83 references that explains Trinity. And I know in our group, we've talked about it some before. And if you're trying to explain to a new believer, what the Trinity is. We believe in the Trinity here at Sandley Chapel. But if they go and look it up in the back of their Bible, they're not going to find the word Trinity. So how are you going to explain that? So if you have the topical Bible, 
you can you have those references that's going to explain to them exactly what it is if you don't know how to explain it to them. And if you're like me, a topical. If you're like me, you know what it is in your heart and your mind, but you may not know how to put it into words to where they can grasp the meaning. Uh, so that's, that's pretty cool. And a Bible handbook, I love this. I use this a lot with our group because it has cool pictures in it that shows us like what stuff look like and, and all we can pass around and makes it more visual. This tool is a combination of an encyclopedia and a commentary in concise form. It's used for quick, quick reference while reading through a particular book of the Bible. And you can get a set of word studies, which I don't really have any of those yet because I'm still working with all this other stuff. But um, So that's just a list of stuff you know, if you, that you can have on hand to help you with um, your Bible study. So you got to plan your time. It's good to keep a notebook and if you want to get some of these tools to help you. Um, when you get ready to start, before you actually start your Bible study, you should always pray. Ask the Lord to just cleanse your heart. Make sure your heart's clean. Make sure your mind's clean. Because you want to be sure that you connect with God, that you don't have any distractions or anything in your way before you get started with your Bible study. You always got... Um, things that will be distracting you. It's always good. I heard one lady say one time she keeps a notebook beside her when she starts hers because she'll be thinking of stuff she needs to do and she's going to jump up and go do that stuff. Just jot it down. Hey, uh, I need to call Jolie and remind her about Bible study. Just make a note of it and continue on with your Bible study. Because if you get up to go make that phone call, you'll never make it back to your Bible study. So. Um, pray that the Holy Spirit will guide you in your study because it's the Holy Spirit that teaches. And uh, that's when your Bible study comes alive. And, and that's what makes the difference. And I, with your little set of stuff, I gave y'all a little orange thing. It says, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. So if you're starting out, you've never done a Bible study, you really don't know what to pray before you start your Bible study, there's your scripture you can pray and just ask God to be with you when you get ready to start your Bible study. Okay. In the blank, spend a little time in prayer. Is that what your blank was there? Mm -hmm. Or? Yeah. Spend a short time in prayer before each study. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm not used to filling in the blanks. Does anybody have any questions so far? Y'all ready to do about an hour and a half Bible study? Let's go, Yoda. They told me I only had three hours tonight. <laughs> All right, y'all ready? All right, let me show you this. This book here by Rick Horn, I know some of y'all probably read some of these books. It has a lot of different Bible study methods in it. Um, and so what I did was I just took the first one, which is a... Um, pretty simple one that I like to use and just to jump out, jump start you, but I wanted to show you this. If you, it's at the carpenter shop if you want to go buy it. Um, it'll help you with Bible study. It's got a lot of good information in it also, um, but there's several different methods in, in there that you can use. But I'm going to just give you this one tonight. It's the devotional method. Um, you take a passage of the Bible, either large or small, and prayerfully meditate on it until the Holy Spirit shows you a way to apply its truth to your own life in a way that is personable, practical, possible, and provable. The goal is for you to seriously, to take seriously the Word of God and do what it says. It's not going to do us any good to do any of this we've been talking about tonight if we are not going to apply it to our lives. You're going to be wasting your time to get up and to read and to memorize the Word if we don't apply it. Do you all agree? Yeah. I mean, really. That's a step I think we're missing is we study and we read and just like Pastor Shane was talking about, about the snakes and the fire, man, that's hard. But when we dare to cross over and apply that Scripture, that's when we'll start growing. And so we've got to 
by faith, somehow get the courage to step out on the water and start applying the word. Because if we don't, we're going to be missing, you know, what it is God's going to do in us and probably those around us because they're going to see change in us. And that's going to bring life to them and people that we're trying to reach. Okay? So that's another thing I want y'all to get tonight. We've we got to study the Word and we got to apply. It's very important. <clears throat> so when you do a devotional Bible study, you just follow four steps. You pray, you meditate, you apply, and you memorize. <clears throat> and that's with any Bible study. So even if you don't do anything I've told you not, you sit down and get your Bible out, pray before you start reading. And whatever you read, meditate on it. You know, just meditate on it. And then whatever you've read, you want to apply and you want to memorize something in that scripture. Those are four things you want to do. So step one, it says pray for insight on how, to, how you're going to apply this passage. Ask God to help you apply the scripture you're studying and show you what he wants you to do. And there's two things he always wants you to do. He wants you to obey his word and he wants you to share it with others. Obey his word and share it with others. That's the first step. The second step is you want to meditate on the verse that you've chosen. <clears throat> Meditation is the key to discovering how you're going to apply. Have any of y'all ever read a verse and you're like, I really don't know exactly. I know I'm supposed to be doing this, but I really don't know exactly how I'm going to do this. And so you may meditate on it two or three days before you get a plan of action. I don't know if any of y'all ever been there or not, but I know I have. <clears throat> You have to meditate on how you're going to apply that scripture to your life. Meditation is, is essentially thought digestion. You can, and the way you can do that, here's some suggestions. You can visualize yourself in the scripture that you're reading. You can put yourself in their place. Um, you can imagine yourself as one of the disciples. You can imagine Jesus is talking to you and you're one of the disciples in scripture. Or you can emphasize words in the passage of study so it'll have a different meaning. To give you an example of that is um, in the scripture where it says, um, for we know God, God is love. If you were to emphasize that, we'll just use that because it's a short one. You can use a long verse, but it'd take a long time. The verse that says God is love, you can say, God is love. God is love. God is love. You get three different meanings. You get it? Mm -hmm. So you can meditate on that verse and get three different meanings out of it. And all I did was emphasize God. The second time I emphasized is. And the third time, love. Or God is peace. Or God is joy. You see what I'm saying? You get three different meanings. And so when you're meditating on the scriptures, you want to meditate on it so you can learn how to apply it to your life. Because there again, if we don't apply the scriptures, it's not going to do us any good for the people around us. Okay? Um, <clears throat> another way to meditate on the scriptures is by personalizing, by putting your name in the place, you know, like for God so loved Melissa that he gave his only begotten son. You put your name in the place. I'm just trying to give you some examples. This is helping you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sort of giving you, bringing it to life, maybe, I hope. All right. Another way is to meditate is to use the space pets, acrostic. And that's a um, typo error. That's supposed to be acrostic. A C R O S T I C. Uh, it's a useful aid to meditation. Each letter represents a question. That can help you apply the passage to your life. And the question, each word asks a question. And the question is, is there any, number one, is sin to confess? So whatever scripture you're studying, is there any <laughs> sin to confess? <laughs> <laughs> so many times in the house. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> Do I need to make any restitution? All right. 
The P stands for, is there any promise to claim? So when you're reading your scripture and you look at it, you ask yourself, is there any promise to claim? Is it, is it a universal promise? Have I met the condition? In other words, the promise may be, I'll be blessed, but I'm not really living according to God's word, so maybe that blessing's not going to apply to me. I may be living in sin, so I'm not going to be receiving God's blessing. You see? The A stands for attitude. Is there any attitude to change? Am I willing to work on a negative attitude and begin building toward a positive one? I mean, when you read that scripture that you're reading, is there any attitude to change? Um, when you're reading that scripture, is there any command to obey? Is that scripture telling you something that you that is giving you a command you're supposed to be doing? And am I willing to do it no matter how I feel? You remember your feelings will get you in trouble. Your emotions will lie to you. You can't go on your emotions. You gotta go on what the word of God says. Y'all know that, right? Yep. Your emotions will lead you down the wrong path. You gotta go absolutely with what the word says, not what you feel. E, is there any example to follow? Is it a positive example for me to copy or a negative one to avoid? P is prayer. Is there any prayer to pray? Just like the prayer of J-Bat. 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 Yeah. That's the same. Is there anything I need to pray back to God? Lord, bless me. Uh, is there any, for E, is there error? Is there any error to avoid? Is there any problem I should be alert to or be aware of? There again, when you're studying this passage, whatever it is, ask yourself these questions. And with your notebook, I guarantee you, if you've got an area in your heart, the Holy Spirit will very quickly point it out to you. Write it down on your notebook. When you're having your quiet time, it's going to be between you and God and the Holy Spirit's going to be the teacher. T is truth. Is there any truth to believe? What new things can I learn about God, the Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, or other biblical teachings? Uh-oh. <laughs> and then S is something to praise God for. Is there anything, is there something to praise God for? Is there something here I can be thankful for? She got her pickle. No, I caught something pop on her hand. She just looked like a might have been her little space pet. <laughs> Alright, did everybody get all of those? Sin, promise, attitude, command, example, prayer, error, truth, and something. Yes. Alright. Um, those are just some ways you can meditate. Alright. Step three, you gotta write out your application. Write out an application you have discovered through your meditation. And when you write out your application, your application should be personable. You should write it in first person, using I or me, talking about yourself. Um, it should be potential, something you know you can do, plan a definite course of action that you intend to take. C, your application should be possible. Because uh, if you don't make it possible, then you're going to be discouraged and you're going to quit. I mean, it's good to try to reach for the stars, but make sure it's something you know you can do. And then D, it should be provable. Um, go ahead and set yourself a time that if it's like someone you know you've got to go see, to talk to, to ask forgiveness, go ahead and set it within a week or two. If it's somebody that's passed on, that's not provable. You're probably not going to be able to talk to them. You know? But you may say, hey, I may want to go talk to a family member. 
about it. Or maybe we go to the grave. Make it something you know you can do. Okay? Um, anybody got any questions? Anybody? And then the last step is to memorize a verse from your passage. Um, memorize, that goes in your blank, a key verse from your study so you can continue to meditate on the passage you're applying and to help remind you of your project. Um, memorize a verse is a key to the application that you've written. And if you'll jot down there beside of it, I'm going to give you four places that you may want to try to do this with. Uh, Psalms 15, that chapter. Psalms 34. Romans 12. 1 John 4. And you can take any one of these. Um, you can do the space pets or um, one of the, the meditations and take one of these chapters, get out your notebook, and go through that chapter and write down and see what you come up with. And I, I want to just tell you real quick something that happened with me with Psalms 34. When I had first got this book and I had went through this and I had wrote out all this stuff with the devotional method, this was about a year and a half ago, I guess, and a little over three years ago, my dad passed away, and we were having a hard time with getting his estate and everything settled, and, and we were, they had never settled my grandmother's estate, and so it was a little bit of a um, struggle going on trying to get everything worked out, and me and my brother and my sister were um, tied up with my stepmother, and so we had decided that we were going to definitely try to do everything God's way. No matter what, we were going to walk in love. And so we had started off in my prayer room at my house on our knees and we'd said, God, we're just going to honor you no matter what. And so we had prayed and we had went through the process. And through the process, there was different journeys we had taken through lawyers and through um, signature experts and just a bunch of stuff that just, the door was closed, the door was closed, the door was closed. So anything, anyway, the thing was about to come to a, to a close, and my brother called, and he's like, you know, I just, I don't know. And he said, I just think we just need to get together and meet, and I said, okay, I'll be right up. He said, sister, if you got any scripture or anything, he said, just come up there. Well, I had been, that morning, I had been, I had just got that book, and see, stuff like that is just the Holy Spirit to me, leading in God, and Pastor Dillard told me, get that book, I had got it. I had sat down with the stuff I just gave y'all, and done Psalms 34. And I did exactly what I just asked y'all to do. And I wrote it down, and so my brother said, if you've got anything, well, I had written down all my stuff, and I had written down how I felt about my dad passing away, and all my family members, and my stepmother, and how I felt about my brother and my sister, and what everything was going on that morning before my brother ever called. So when he called, I said, I'll be up right after work. And he said, well, I don't have time. Call sister and tell her to come. And if she's got any scripture, I said, okay. I called my sister and I said, meet me at Steve's, 4 o'clock. If you got any scripture, bring your Bible. She said, okay. We go up there and we meet. And I had an ugly letter from my uncle. And I asked my brother, I said, do you have a fire pit? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, I got some letters I want to burn because I just want to be clean. I want to just be rid of it. I want to burn it. Be done with it. He said, okay. We sit around the table and we air our hearts and we get a little bit ill with each other at times. And, uh, and but we get everything out and then we sit there and we sort of get a little bit calm. And I've got my notebook because I'm proud because Pastor Dale done told me to do my Bible study and I've done, done Psalms 34 and I've got my three pages written out and I'm ready to preach to my brother and sister. I'm just waiting for their thing to be quiet so I can get my, and I've got it opened up. And I'm just sitting there with it open. And my sister's sitting here, and my brother's sitting over there. And so then we're sitting there, and I'm, my heart's beating, and I'm thinking, I'm getting ready to really give them my scripture. And my sister says, Well, I feel like God has told me to read to y'all Psalms 34. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I just took my notebook and just slid it across the table. Well, I let her read. 
I let her read and say everything she had to say. And then I just took my notebook and just slid it because it was confirmation. And I said, read to sister what my scripture was I had for y'all today. And he looked down and he got teary-eyed and he said, Psalms 34. And so we got up and we went over there and we started a fire. And I put my letter in there and we started to pray. And we got beside of the fire and we were holding hands and we closed our eyes. And I never opened up my eyes and we were right next to it. And my sister started praying first and I never opened up my eyes and I got to where I couldn't breathe. And instead of opening up my eyes to look, we were like this. I just, I couldn't breathe and I just turned my head away real quick like that. And as soon as I did, God said to me in my heart, He says, you, y'all smell that has been coming up to me has not been a good smell. And I've had to turn my head away because you've been grumbling and you've not been walking in love. And I've been nowhere near you. And see, the thing of it is, if you don't learn to read the Word and follow, even what Pastor Dale preaches on Sunday morning, and follow the Holy Spirit and learn to apply His Word, it's a lie. And God wants to do something in y'all's life. But you're going to have to make that time at home. And you're going to have to apply the Word. And it, it, it's for real. And so that's the thing I want you to get tonight. I want you to dare to make that time. Is so important. And so I just want to share that with you um, before we go on. we got two more steps, and they're not nearly as long as the Bible. Um, but to me, the Bible, when you get the Bible, it's going to teach you all about prayer. It's going to teach you all about lifestyle. But I wanted you to get the, the Bible and the tools to use for that. Um, we're talking about spiritual growth. Your second thing for you to have, if you're going to grow spirit, spiritually, is prayer. Um, prayer isn't difficult, it's just simply talking to God. Mark 1.35 says, Early the next morning Jesus woke and left the house while it was still dark. He went to a place to be alone and to pray. Luke 5.16 says, Jesus often slipped away to be alone so he could pray. And that sounds like to me during the daytime, in the evening, when things were tough, he slipped away. A lot went on, they get to looking around, Jesus would be gone, he done slipped away. He had to have his time alone with the Father. It's no different for us. You have to make that time alone to be with the Father. God wants to communicate with you. Just like when you fell in love with your spouse and you told them everything, He wants to hear your heart, your desires, your hearts, your dreams. And the sweetest part about our life is not so much our accomplishments and what we're doing, but it's our journey along the way as we're making those accomplishments. You know, it's not what we get done, but it's the journey along the way as we're getting stuff done. And that's the sweetest part about prayer. Um, I had this book here that a friend of mine gave me. It says, 199 Treasures of Wisdom on Talking with God. And I just want to read a couple of lines out of it. They're just one-liners I thought might help you understand about prayer. The most important and profitable time of my whole day is the time I spend with God. Isn't that sweet? Mm -hmm. Never let me say I have no time for God. <laughs> Communion with God through His Word and prayer is as indispensable to me as the food I eat and the air I breathe. I need to spend time with God even when I don't even know what to pray. As a Christian, I should not be afraid to promise to pray every day. When I draw near to God in humble prayer, I take the first step in the path that leads to fellowship with God. And the last one is, the spirit of prayer is stretching with all my might after the life of God. Don't you just love it? I mean, we don't even really have to know how to pray. We just have to know that we want to spend that time with God and just tell, talk to Him. Just like we talk to our best friend or like we talk to our spouse or, or whoever it is that we're the most comfortable talking with. 
I'll tell you how I learned how to pray. I, I didn't really used to know how to pray. And um, I started talking to Libby Doo on the phone in the mornings. And I tell you, if you want to know how to pray, just call Libby in the mornings. Amen. Amen. Because she has a spirit about her where you can just pray the silliest prayers and she just teaches you how to talk to God. And it's a place to where you can just, I don't know, you just learn how to pray. And um, she really taught me how to relax and just be able to really commune with God to where now my, my time with God has become much sweeter. Uh, and I guess that's how we learn how to do anything in our lives. We have those examples. Okay, Mike, if you want to come on up. The last thing we're going to talk about, if you're going to grow spiritually, what's the first thing? What was number one? What was number one? The Bible. Number one. What's number two? Prayer. Number three is a lifestyle worship. It says, but I will... I will sing about your strength. In the morning I will sing about your love. You are my defender, my place of safety in times of trouble. Worship is not just an event. It is an attitude. It is a way of life. There is something about worship that reminds us of how peaceful God is. The music you listen to sets the tone for your whole atmosphere. The music gets in your head and it just replays over and over and over. Um, and that goes back to Proverbs. It says, a man thinketh, so is he. I encourage you to think about what is going on inside your head. Is it the argument you had at home before you left the house? <coughs> is it the worship music before you got out of your car and went into work? Is it a dirty joke when you're out on the floor? What's in your head? Is a man think it's so is he? Whatever's playing in your head, that's your lifestyle of worship. That's, that's your life. That's what you're going to do all day. And God wants us meditating on his word. He wants us singing those songs to him in our heart and in our mind. And that's what's going to make us be overcomers. Those songs in our head. Um, most of the music we sing are words straight from the scripture, and there's power in the word. So when we sing those songs, it's not just a song. There's power in words, ain't it, Brian? There's feeling in those words. There's strength in those words. Uh, and if you feel that you don't, like you're not really growing spiritually and you don't know why, then I, just take, I ask you to take a look at what it is that you're feeding yourself, your music or your TV. What are your hobbies? What's your, um, what's your company? Who do you keep company with? Um, and then I put, they are Holy Spirit bouncers in our life. And I, I was just, what that means is, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. But there's things that we can do that will ask the Holy Spirit, do you mind leaving? I'm fixing to listen to the story, Joe. Holy Spirit, be mine, maybe for a few seconds. Excuse me, sir. I'm going to watch you set the show. Would you mind leaving for a few seconds? Excuse me, Holy Spirit. I'm going to look at this on the computer. Do you mind leaving for a few seconds? Just like a bouncer goes into a bar. Do you mind leaving? Excuse me, sir. I'm going to go forward with this man. Would you mind leaving for a few seconds? You see? Excuse me, I'm going to listen to this song that has words in it that I know don't line up with the Word of God. Holy Spirit, you mind leaving for a few seconds? It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. It can't just be Sunday morning. You can always be feeding on what the Word says. And the Word is good. It's good. And we can trust it. It takes time to change ingrained character traits and habits and attitudes. And new habits and ways of thinking are not set in just one day. So you must realize that when God wants to build a positive quality in your life, He must allow you to encounter situations where you have to choose the right thing instead of following your old natural way. We want our new natural way 
to be a lifestyle of worship. That's our goal. So we're going to end tonight with a worship song. And um, I just pray that it's going to be your heart and your desire. Whatever you do, you're going to leave with passion. And you're going to have passion that God's going to be your first love, whatever you do. Even if you don't leave, you're going to have passion and love for God.